Hi all, welcome to today's session where we will discuss how to build a language using APS, right? So this is uh, primarily useful for your course because you will do a mini project where you will implement your own languages based on the concepts that we learned throughout the course, right? So let's get started. So first things first, this is our agenda for today. We will begin by looking at what are language workbenches. Uh, MPS is a kind of language, uh, MPS is a language workbench, so we need to understand what language workbenches are. Why specifically MPS? Uh, uh, there are other language workbenches, of course, with their own advantages and disadvantages, and MPS has its own advantage and disadvantages. So we'll look at why MPS, why, why it's interesting and motivating to learn a new language workbench right as i suppose most of you have to learn this learn and learn it new right learn it fresh we look at what are the different aspects of mps by this uh, i mean what are the different parts of mps that you need to utilize to define your language its syntax and semantics right and finally we will uh, build our own state machine language using mps uh, which is uh, uh, we'll uh, basically giving you an overview giving you an overview of what are the things you need to do to uh, uh, build your own language using it, right? So the first part of the talk will be rather short, right? Uh, I'll try to keep the presentation part today very short and directly dive into uh, the practical aspects of it, right? Okay, so what's a language workbench? A language workbench is a set of tools to create a language, right? Uh, of course, a language, you uh, you can argue that a language, programming language, or uh, general purpose or uh, domain specific is just another piece of software. So why can't I simply use existing programming languages to code them, right? And that is possible, right? So languages like Scala actually have uh, good support for building your own programming languages, uh, its syntax, semantics, and so on and so forth. And most old, or I mean, all languages are programmed in some other language, right? Older versions of Java were coded with C. So it's not, uh, of course you can do it, but uh, in the modern world, uh, there are specific kinds of tools called language workbenches, which allow you to think of your language in terms of syntax semantics, which is the main perspective from which a language designer comes from, right? When you, we already saw it, when you're defining your, when you're designing a language, you first think of the syntax, how it should look like, and then the semantics, what the language means or what programs in that language mean, right? So language workbenches are tools that are specifically designed for you to define your syntax and semantics. Of course, syntax and semantics are not the only thing you must worry about when creating a language, right? You need to make sure your language has good static analysis support, your language is good tooling, and also modern languages uh, tend to benefit from supporting specific notations for specific kind of users or domain experts that use that particular language, right? So you want a language workbench that allows you to define all of these uh, things with quite, quite a bit of ease and also quite intuitively, right? The, the notation with which you define your language should be closer to how you think when you're designing your language, right, on paper and pen. Right, okay. From this perspective, there are lots of language workbenches, uh, uh, and some of the popular ones here are Xtext, Racket, Spoofax, right? Xtext uh, is more uh, used in the industry professionally. Racket and Spoofax are primarily popular in the academic world for you to teach how to implement uh, programming languages, but of course, uh, they are not specific to the academic world. Uh, there are modern languages that are built using Racket, especially, right? Uh, but the primary difference between all of the other language workbenches and MPS is that it uses what is called a projectional editing, right? And all of these uh, uh, language workbenches provide support, support to define your syntax, semantics, uh, static analysis, and tooling in their own way. Uh, of course, they are good in their own way, right? I'm not arguing that uh, MPS is better than them in these aspects, but because NPS uses this uh, no, notion called projectional editing, it is able, you are able to provide different notations for your uh, language much more easily, right? So for that, let's look at what a projectional editor is, right? Uh, traditional, so uh, for, to understand projectional editing, we first need to briefly look at what traditional textual editing is, right? So in traditional textual editing, which most of you are familiar with, you write your program as a text file, right? You give it an extension, 
.c, .java, .cs, whatever, right? It is parsed, the compiler parses it into an abstract representation. It's mostly an abstract syntax tree. It could be something else, right? It's essentially an intermediate representation that the compiler can understand, perform analysis on, perform optimizations on, and then using the abstract representation, it generates uh, executable code, right? Executable code that is fed into your machine to be used uh, directly to, uh, it's directly executed there, right? Um, projection and editing differs from this in one main aspect in the sense that there is no AD, there is no uh, textual um, kind of code that is generated into the, or parsed into the abstract representation. Rather, you directly define, uh, or not, sorry, you directly modify, or you create an instance of your abstract representation and modify, right? And, uh, but the advantages are, right now it seems like most of the advantages are internal, but there is an external advantage too, right? So of course, if you're just uh, talking about editing your creating instances of your tree saying, hey, this is my root node, this is my left child, right child, blah, 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 it's going to be quite tedious, right? For, uh, for this purpose, MPS differentiates between what is called a concrete syntax and an abstract syntax. The abstract syntax is the background, uh, the tree in the background, the abstract syntax tree in the background, Concrete syntax can be multiple. So you can have a concrete syntax uh, for mathematical equations that looks like text, but also something that looks like an actual equation, right? So you can have multiple projections or multiple editors providing multiple notations for the same structural abstract syntax tree, right? So, yes, so, uh, but for your course, the concept, this uh, differentiation um, is not so much important, but for those of you who are interested, uh, I think it's cool to know that this is how NPS internally operates, right? So for, from the perspective of building your language, you will do the same things. You will define your syntax, you will define your semantics, and you will define your tooling around that, right? Okay, so uh, one more reason why NPS, right? Uh, so NPS is no longer just a niche uh, tool that is used in some corner of, uh, corner of some uh, university somewhere, right? So professional languages are built using MPS, right? Embedar is there, there's Meta R, which is a, a language for data scientists and kernel F is a fully functional, uh, well, uh, almost fully functional programming language, or uh, functional language, right? And they're also used in important aspects in industry. Uh, the Dutch tax office uh, has their own DSLs defined using MPS, same with uh, uh, companies like Audi. Dativ uses a version of kernel F. Dativ is this, for those of you who have gotten your salaries from Germany, you must know that, uh, you must have seen this Dativ logo. Dativ is this company which essentially uh, looks up the law and decides how your salary is calculated. So the domain experts who calculate their salaries use an extension of kernel F, right? And then uh, uh, software like Utrecht, right? Which is a, which is, an alternative or like which is a github issue tracker kind of thing provided by jetbrains uh, this is currently maintained and programmed using uh, dsl built on top of mps right okay so uh, now enough uh, motivation let's look at how one can build languages using mps right uh, so in order to uh, in order to know how to think about building languages using mps you can start with something you already know we know that when uh, when you're designing a language, you first need to design the syntax, how your language looks like, and then you need to design your semantics, what your language means, right? We saw uh, versions of this, uh, how to express syntax using uh, BNF and ABNF. We saw how to express semantics using uh, operational semantics, right? So uh, how do you implement them using MPS? So for defining the syntax, you I mentioned before that you need to define uh, what is the internal abstract syntax tree representation? You also need to define what is the concrete syntax, right? For the abstract syntax, you use the structure aspect. For the concrete syntax, you use the editor aspect, right? We will see both of them using a demo, right? And then for semantics, there are two ways. One is you can define a generator. Essentially, when you're defining a generator, you're essentially mapping your language into another language. It can also be texture. You can uh, directly map to another language in, that it exists inside MPS, or you can also use the text generator to generate code in any language you want. So uh, the kind of catch here is that 
the semantics of your uh, language, if you use the generator, is kind of limited by the semantics of the target language that you're generating to, right? Let's say you have a state machine language and you generate Java code out of it. You're kind of inheriting the syntax from Java. Of course, you can kind of play around with the syntax by uh, being clever with how you map your, how you map uh, nodes in your language to the nodes in Java, but you're kind of limited by it. This is similar, uh, the, in in use case, this is similar to, for example, thinking yeah about how uh, C is uh, C is used to build a compiler for Java, right? Modern versions of Java bootstrap, but earlier versions, if you use C, if you use a language A to uh, define a compiler for language B, you're kind of limited by your la the semantics of B is kind of in a way limited by the semantics of A, right? Of course, but the other more cleaner way to translate your semantics, like the operational semantics that we defined for our uh, toy languages, right, is to use the interpreter. In, using your interpreter, you define evaluators for each kind of node in your language, similar to what we saw with operational semantics, and then you kind of say, tell how the nodes, uh, particular nodes are interpreted, right? On top of syntax and semantics, uh, for any language support, you need to also have other elements, right? You need to have tool support, and for defining good tool support, you can use the intentions aspect, the constraints aspect to define what is the scope. We'll see all about this. You can also define type system, which are, of course, partly semantics, but the type system aspect is also used to provide good tools, right, using MPS. Of course, the other aspect is the behavior aspect, which is not directly uh, uh, mapped to attribute grammars, but for those of you who, who come from my course who learned about attribute grammars, right, uh, attribute grammars are ways to synthesize and inherit properties for individual nodes in your uh, individual nodes in your uh, in your tree, right? In your past tree. So behavior is uh, behavior aspect allows you to define these kind of properties for individual nodes, right? Okay. So enough theory. Let's get to more practical stuff, right? Let's briefly look at, uh, again, this is something that I already told you about. Syntax has two elements. You need to define your structure, which is the abstract syntax tree, and then abstract representation, and then uh, the editor for the concrete syntax, right? As this example shows, your concrete syntax can be graphical, it can be textual, it can be tables, it can be whatever, right? So yeah. OK, so here is a brief overview of how you define your structure and editor for structure. You uh, Again, all of this will be much clearer when we look at the demo. Right. Uh, so for structure, you essentially look at your uh, EBNF, translate it into some kind of class hierarchy, and then uh, you, you translate your uh, grammar into some kind of class hierarchy, and then you can uh, use the a concept of concepts here. So a concept essentially is used to define a kind of node. You can define properties for concepts. You can define children for concepts. So for example, a binary expression will have two children. Both of them are expressions, right? So something like that. And then you can have references to other concepts, right? You can also have interface concepts if you want to collect different kinds of, you can have an I expression and then uh, expression could be an interface and then binary expression plus expression. All of these could be uh, sub as could implement this uh, expression concept, right? So essentially you kind of translate your grammar into a class hierarchy and then uh, map it to the structure aspect. For editor, you use the notion of uh, cells and grid. So you just say in what cell, uh, which par, which child or which uh, reference or property goes into, right? Of course, you can do a lot more thing. You can define graphical editors and stuff. And for those, you have uh, other other kind of editors in your uh, in uh, in MPS, right? So yeah, we'll we'll look uh, we'll look at about all of them, right? Or not all of them, but uh, we'll get a better idea when we are looking at the demo. So semantics, as I mentioned before, you have two ways of defining semantics. One is using the generator, where you map concepts of your language into code in some other language right here. A function argument in your language is mapped to, I don't know, an integer and then some meta variable x whose value is, I don't know, uh, whose value is kind of coded here uh, inside the inspector. I'll show you how. And then, of course, you can also do model to text generation if you don't have a equivalent of the language, target language you want to generate in MPS. Uh, right, so MPS has uh, very good support for Java, uh, fairly good support for C, right? And the uh, number of languages it supports is increasing. But for example, if you want to generate Rust code, right? So currently there is no support in MPS, uh, but for that you could simply use the model to text generator, right? Uh, 
And interpreters are a way to evaluate expressions, right? If you want to get immediate live feedback, you would use the interpreter, all right? Uh, similar to your so operational semantics, you would say, hey, for this expression, I want it to be evaluated like this, right? So, okay, I think demonstration will make it clear. Talking of demonstration, what are we going to build today, right? We are going to build two languages. One is a state machine language with which I will show you how to implement semantics using a generator. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a state machine is, a brief refresher, a state machine is, uh, is, uh, is a machine where uh, you can have states and events, and then essentially states have transitions, and transitions are triggered on particular events and tell you which state to go to. So for example, uh, this initial state of my state machine here is state one, and on um, the transition here says that if the event one is triggered, then please move the uh, current state to state two, right? And similar to state two, if it's event one, then go to state one for event two, come back to state. Of course, this is poor design, but uh, this is to describe how our state machine language will look like, right? And of course, uh, here you can see uh, the kind of tool support that I was talking about. Here is a type, mach uh, type machine uh, checking rule, which tells you that, hey, uh, your state machine can have only one initial state, right? So we'll see how to implement all of this. And then here for the state machine language, we'll be generating Java code, all right? Uh, so uh, yeah, so let's not go into the details now. Let's go into the details when we are looking at the demo. And then the second language we'll implement is to show how interpreters work, right? So we'll implement a test state machine language, which is dependent on the state machine language itself. So every test case is for a particular state machine. And then in the, state, in the test case, you can have two kinds of statements. One is the assert statement and the other is the trigger statement. So assert statement allows you to uh, assert whether your current state is whatever state one, and then you trigger an event, and then you can check again, hey, I've triggered one, is event one, uh, am I going to go to state one, right? So of course this is wrong, so you will implement, we will implement an interpreter to interpret if each of these assert statements are in the right accepted state, right? So that kind of brings us uh, to the end of the presentation part of our, uh, of our session today, we'll jump right into the demo part of it.